Welcome back everyone for another deep dive. This time we're taking a close look at the life and work of a truly fascinating figure in plant ecology, John Philip Grime. A great choice. Grime's work really changed how we see the plant world. We've got some great excerpts from a biographical memoir published by the Royal Society to guide us. And um, just from glancing through it, I've got to say, this guy was a real character. Yeah, he definitely left his mark, both on the field of ecology and on everyone who knew him. So we're going to dive deep into how plants adapt, form communities, and even shape entire ecosystems all through the lens of Grimes' work. That's like a plan. And, you know, right off the bat, his name, John Philip Grime, it doesn't exactly scream, you know, delicate botanist. No, it does not. There's a certain, I don't know, a certain edge to it. Like maybe he should be wrestling bears or something. Well, in a way, he was wrestling with nature's mysteries. I mean, Grime, it actually comes from a Norse Viking name. Really? Yeah. It means grim or fierce one. Mm. And it's even linked back to Odin, the Norse god. Whoa, okay, hold on. So we got this guy. Named after a fierce Viking god, diving deep into the world of plants. I'm already hooked. It's like he was destined for a life uncovering nature's secrets. Right. And speaking of destiny, the memoir talks about his childhood in rural Manchester and how he spent hours exploring this species-rich wetland called the Dip. The Dip. That's a great name. Yeah. And it makes you wonder, right? Like, did those early experiences shape his scientific mind? Did exploring this wild little ecosystem spark his curiosity? It's certainly possible. I mean, think about it. Grime was out there observing, making connections. Who knows what mysteries he was pondering as a kid, knee deep in the dip. Maybe he was already envisioning his future groundbreaking research. Although the memoir also mentions that he's a huge fan of Manchester City Football Club. Oh, yeah. A diehard fan, apparently. And an avid angler, too. So not just a brilliant mind, but a well-rounded individual with passions outside of science. Absolutely. I think that's important to remember about any scientist, really. They're not just robots and lab coats. They're people with hobbies, interests, and, you know, a love for their football team. Exactly. It reminds us that even the most groundbreaking discoveries come from people who are, well, just people. <laughs> all right, so let's move on to his academic journey. It all started at the University of Sheffield in 1953. Right, and there he focused on grassland plants for his PhD. That work eventually led him to the unit of comparative plant ecology, where he really made his mark. And he wasn't just an armchair theorist, was he? Grime was known for his dedication to field work, like thousands of vegetation surveys over decades. Yeah, he wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty, literally. Grime believed in meticulous observation, careful data collection. He was out there year after year, measuring, recording, analyzing. It's that kind of dedication that leads to breakthroughs, isn't it? Absolutely. And in Grime's case, it led him to develop a model that kind of turned the field on its head. Hmm. Intriguing. I think you're talking about the humped back model, right? That's the one. And it all started with a simple question. What factors influence species richness? You know, the number of different species in a given area. You'd think the more plants an environment can support, the more diverse it would be. Right. That's what a lot of people assumed. Yeah. But Grimes' research showed that sometimes it's actually the opposite. A bit of environmental stress, not too much, but just enough can actually lead to greater diversity. So less is more, in a way. In some cases, yeah. Think of it like a muscle. A little bit of stress makes it stronger. And that's essentially what Grimes' humped back model illustrates. Species richness actually peaks at intermediate levels of productivity. Too much productivity, and you might end up with a few dominant species that just crowd everything else out. Makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah. Sometimes a little bit of struggle is what leads to greater resilience and diversity. Right. Like a forest that's been through a fire might actually be more diverse than one that hasn't. I wonder if that applies to other areas of life as well. Now, that's a question worth pondering. But back to Grime, his model wasn't universally accepted, of course. I mean, it challenged a long-held assumption. But it definitely sparked some important conversations in the field of ecology. And that's the mark of a truly great scientist, isn't it? Someone who isn't afraid to question conventional wisdom. Absolutely. Someone who pushes the boundaries and makes us rethink what we thought we knew. And, you know, Grimes' humped back model was just the beginning. He went on to develop what's considered his most famous work, the CSR theory. Oh, yeah, the CSR theory. This is where things get really interesting. Okay, I'm ready. Break it down for us. What's the core idea behind CSR theory? Well, it all boils down to this. Grime categorized plants based on their survival strategies. He identified three main types. 
Competitors, right. stress tolerators, and ruderals. Competitors, stress tolerators, and ruderals. Okay, I'm definitely intrigued. Can you give us a rundown of each type? Sure. Think about it this way. You've got those pesky dandelions pushing up through the cracks in your patio, right? <laughs> the bane of my existence. <laughs> Well, those are ruderals. They thrive in disturbed environments. They grow fast, reproduce quickly, spread their seeds far and wide. Then you've got your stress tolerators. Think of a slow-growing cactus in the desert. They're adapted to harsh conditions, conserving water, making the most of limited resources. And finally, picture a towering tree in a dense forest. That's a competitor focused on outgrowing and overshadowing its rivals. Wow, so those three categories are like everywhere yeah it's like he gave us a whole new way of seeing the plant world that's exactly what he did and to help visualize these different strategies he came up with what's known as grimes triangle grimes triangle okay tell me more it's more than just a shape it's a way to understand how these strategies competitor stress tolerator ruderal how they all relate to the resources that are available in an environment and to the level of disturbance each corner of the triangle represents an extreme and plants can actually fall anywhere within that triangle depending on their mix of traits i love that a simple visual to represent this complex world of plant life yeah and it emphasizes that nature rarely fits neatly into boxes it's all about gradients, trade-offs, and adaptations. And this triangle, well, it helped ecologists to see plant communities in a whole new light. It wasn't just about what species were present, but also how they were interacting with each other and with their environment, and how those interactions, those strategies, shaped the ecosystem as a whole. It's really amazing how this triangle, this simple shape, kind of unlocks a whole new understanding of how plant communities work. Like he gave us this decoder ring for seeing all these hidden strategies going on. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? And he didn't stop there. Grime was also really interested in how these strategies, you know, these ways of surviving and thriving, how they played out on a larger scale, especially as the world changes around us. Yeah, that's something we can't ignore these days, right? Climate change, all these different pressures on the environment. So how did Grime approach that? Well, he started focusing on something called functional traits. It's like, okay, we've got these categories, competitor, stress tolerator, ruderal, but what do those actually mean in terms of how a plant, you know, actually does stuff in its environment? Right. Instead of just labeling it, we're looking at how it functions. Like, how does that dandelion use its deep taproot to access water or spread yeah. its seeds or whatever? Exactly. So you're taking those categories and then digging deeper. Each one of those characteristics you mentioned, those are what we call functional traits. They're all about how the plant interacts with its environment. And Graham didn't just theorize about these traits. He actually launched this huge effort to measure them, you know, for hundreds of different plant species. Wow, that's ambitious. What was that project called? It was called the Integrated Screening Program, or ISP for short. And it was groundbreaking, really, because mm. it allowed scientists to start linking specific traits to the way ecosystems work on a grand scale. So what kinds of traits were they actually measuring? Oh, all kinds of things. Leaf size, nutrient content, how deep the roots grow, how long the plant lives, you name it. For instance, a plant that has, say, a lot of nutrients in its leaves, well, it'll probably decompose quicker when it dies, right? So those nutrients go back into the soil faster. Or a plant with really deep roots might be able to access water that other plants can't get to. So it has an advantage when things get dry. It's like putting together this giant puzzle, right? Yeah. Where each trait is a piece that fits into the bigger picture of how the ecosystem functions. Exactly. And Grime was like, you know, the master puzzle solver. The ISP was a game changer because it allowed scientists to say, OK, this trait is actually linked to this process, like nutrient cycling or carbon storage or whatever. And that's huge because it means we can start to understand those processes, you know, the very foundations of how our planet operates in much more detail. Wow, it's pretty profound when you think about it that way. It is. And Grime, as he's, you know, delving deeper into all this research, he comes up with another key idea. All right, lay it on me. What's the next big idea? It's called mass ratio theory. Mass ratio theory. Okay, I'm listening. What's that all about? We know how Grime was really fascinated by competition, like how different plants compete for resources. Well, this theory kind of builds on that. It emphasizes the role that dominant species play in shaping the productivity of an entire ecosystem. Dominant species, meaning like the ones that are really abundant. Right. Like think about a forest that's mostly made up of these towering redwood trees versus a grassland with a mix of grasses and wildflowers. Even if they both have the same number of different species, 
the redwood forest is going to function really differently, right? Because those redwood trees are calling the shots, basically. They're shaping the environment for everything else that lives there. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So it's not just about how many species there are, but also which ones are the most common and what traits they have. Exactly. It's about understanding the players on the field, so to speak. And in Graham's view, those dominant species, the ones with the most biomass, they have a disproportionate impact on how the whole ecosystem works. This is also fascinating. Grime proposed something called the Universal Adaptive Strategy Theory, or UAST. It's a big, bold idea, suggesting that the fundamental trade-offs shaping plant life also influence the evolution of all organisms, from bacteria to blue whales. Okay, I'm hooked. Explain this one to me. I need to hear how a cheetah and a cactus are playing by the same rules. The key is that all organisms have a limited amount of energy and resources. They have to make choices about how to invest those resources to maximize their survival and reproduction. And they all face similar challenges. Competition for resources, environmental stress, and the need to reproduce quickly. Those are the same pressures driving those CSR strategies and plants. It's not a perfect model, but it provides a new lens for viewing the incredible diversity of life on Earth. It makes you wonder if these strategies are written into the very fabric of life itself. It's like nature's operating system running in the background of everything. And that brings us back to one of the reasons you sent us this paper. You're interested in climate change, right? Well, Grime was one of the first ecologists to sound the alarm about how these changing conditions would affect plants and entire ecosystems. It's easy to forget that climate change wasn't always a mainstream concern. So Grime was ahead of his time in seeing those potential impacts. What kind of work did he do in this area? Back in the 80s and 90s, he set up this long-term experiment at Buxton where he and his team were manipulating temperature and precipitation to see how different plants would respond. It was like creating mini climate change scenarios to see how the ecological game would play out. That's such an innovative approach, like a fast forward button on evolution. What did those experiments reveal? Did any plant strategies come out on top? One of the most significant findings was that those productive ecosystems like grasslands are actually more sensitive to climate change than less productive ones. Grimes' research suggests that we might see a shift in plant communities, and that could have a cascading effect on entire ecosystems. It's like nature is shuffling the deck, and we're not sure what the new hand will look like. But isn't there something we can do? It feels like we're just passively watching this ecological drama unfold. Grime was a firm believer in taking action. He argued that we need to understand these plant strategies, these rules of the game, if we want to make informed conservation decisions. It's not enough to just protect individual species. We need to conserve the processes that allow ecosystems to adapt and thrive. So it's about creating the right conditions for those strategies to play out, for nature to find its own balance even as the world changes around us. Mm -hmm. It's a humbling thought. It is. Grimes' work reminds us that we're not separate from nature. We're players in this game too, and our choices have a profound impact on how it unfolds. It's not just about plants. It's about understanding the interconnectedness of all living things. It's a lesson we can all apply to our own lives, even if we don't have a PhD in ecology. Speaking of connections, there's another idea Grime explored that I think you'll find particularly relevant. He called it the twin filter model, and it builds on everything we've discussed so far. Okay, I'm intrigued. What are these twin filters all about, and how do they fit into this larger picture of plant strategies and changing environments? Imagine you have a vacant lot, a blank slate in the ecological world. Suddenly, all sorts of plants start arriving, seed blown by the wind, carried by birds, or just lying dormant in the soil. But not all of them will make it. Grind proposed that there are two filters that determine which plants ultimately survive and form a community. So it's like nature is holding auditions for the best suited plants. Exactly. The first filter, called the primary CSD equilibrium filter, acts like a broad screening process based on those fundamental CSR strategies. If the environment is harsh and nutrient poor, only stress tolerators have a chance. If it's constantly disturbed, like that vacant lot, root rules might dominate. And if it's resource rich and relatively stable, competitors will likely take center stage. It's like each environment has a specific set of entry requirements, but that doesn't explain how we get such diverse communities within those broad categories, does it? What's the second filter all about? The second filter, called the proximal filter, gets down to the nitty-gritty details of species interactions. It's about those finer scale adaptations that give plants an edge in a specific location. For instance, 
A plant might have a unique way of accessing nutrients in the soil, or it might be better at attracting certain pollinators, or it might have a specific defense against a local herbivore. So the first filter sets the stage, and the second filter fine-tunes the cast of characters. It's like a two-step process for creating an ecosystem. What are some real-world examples of how this plays out? Imagine a coastal dune environment. It's windy, sandy, and exposed to salt spray, so only certain stress tolerators can handle those conditions. But within that harsh environment, you might have micro-variations in elevation, moisture, or soil composition. Those subtle differences create opportunities for a variety of plants to find their niche. So even within a seemingly uniform habitat, there's this hidden complexity, this interplay of broad filters and fine-scale adaptations. It's incredible how nature manages to pack so much diversity into every corner of the planet. It is. And this twin filter model helps us understand how both large-scale environmental factors and those smaller-scale species interactions work together to shape the patterns of biodiversity we see. It's another layer of complexity in that ecological operating system we were talking about earlier. This deep dive has been a real eye-opener. It's amazing how much we can learn about the world around us by studying something as seemingly simple as a plant. And we've only just scratched the surface. John Philip Grimes' work was incredibly influential, not just in botany, but in ecology as a whole. He left behind a legacy that continues to inspire scientists today. Grimes' work gives us this amazing framework, helping us make more informed decisions that benefit both humanity and the planet. And it's also a reminder that even the simplest observations can lead to incredible insight. Just like that unassuming wetland near Grimes' childhood home sparked his lifelong fascination with plants, the world around us is brimming with wonders waiting to be discovered. Who knows what you might find if you just start paying attention. So to our listener, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep learning. There's a whole universe of knowledge out there, and maybe, just maybe, you'll stumble upon your own unique strategy for thriving in this incredible world we call home. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. It's been a pleasure exploring Grimes' legacy with you. And until next time, keep diving deep. Mm.